Okay, so this video covers the two sample t-test. Um, we already covered the uh, one sample t-test and um, that was pretty good, you know, it allowed us to make some pretty uh, powerful statistical statements that had real value. So let's see if we can uh, do something similar for the two sample t-test. And uh, in order to get there, I want to be a bit more explicit about the meaning of the p-value. We talk about uh, some signal-to-noise ratios, how that plays a role in statistical testing. And then I want to see if with all that knowledge that we covered here, whether you can actually figure out the two-sample t-test by yourself. So let's start with a review of um, those statistical statements that we could make based on the one-sided t-test. And you can ask a question and uh, give an answer or give a statement. And we had two versions of this. So one was, what's the lower bound of some unknown population parameter with 95% certainty, right? So this was our confidence interval idea. So if we determine a lower bound and an upper bound, where the true population mean sets uh, with 95% certainty, then we have a confidence interval. And the answer would be, I'm 95% sure that mu is larger, some calculated value. Um, but then we could also do that calculation or unit conversion from axes to axes the other way and ask a slightly different question, right? So that was a one-sided, one-sample t-test. How sure can you be that mu is larger than 650? So that's our arbitrary bound. We set this first and then we calculate the probability. And the answer is my true population mean is larger than 650 with that particular probability, 99.3%. So those were both useful and powerful statements. So when we move on to compare two means, um, those statements will be similar, except that we don't use an arbitrary threshold in this case, but we compare one population mean with another. And you may wonder, well, what about the consciousness interval question? That I'm not quite sure that makes sense now with the lower bound and upper bound, but you will see a difference between mu1 and mu2, right? So that's going to be the interesting part. So I mentioned a couple of times before that this type of test is actually not that interesting. And uh, uh, when it comes to uh, two sample t-tests, you know, I don't usually just want to know whether mean1 and mean2 are different. Uh, most of the time I know that they are because they are different varieties, so they are different by definition. I want to know by how much. So in order to ask this question right, let's take another way to look at uh, this. And it actually works also for the one-sided t-test just as much for, as for the two-sided t-test. So what, I, what I'm actually investigating is a difference here, right? So I have a threshold and a mean from one sample and I'm observing a difference. And uh, the same is true for two sample tests. So in this case, I have two means and I observe a difference, but I don't know what the true difference really is, right? So it could be that the true mean one is bigger than the true mean two. It could actually be the other way around too, right? So um, it could be that my sampling was particularly unlucky and I picked large ones from this and small ones from that one and I just get an opposite result. Or it could also be that they are the same. If I have some sort of treatment that has absolutely zero effect, I'm essentially sampling from the same population. So that is theoretically also possible in some cases. So one way I can rephrase my statistical statements uh, from the one sample t-test is, what's the probability that that delta here that I observe in my one sample or two sample t-test um, what's the probability that that difference is as big or bigger just by random chance? So if the true mean was zero or uh, even the other way around. Or slightly simpler put, uh, could this difference here that I, that I observe, could this be due to random chance? And the answer is yes, it, it always can. And the probability is P. <laughs> Right? So, so that's what P really means. Um, that is the probability that I, that I would have been wrong in my previous statistical statements. Um, so if I claim variety A is bigger than 650 with a 99.3% chance, I could have been wrong, right? So there is a small chance, 0 0.007, that I would have been wrong, that it's actually not, you know, that it's equal or even less. So that is my P-value. 
that the difference that I observe is just a random sample artifact. That's what the p-value really means. And that probability here that I'm wrong depends on two main factors. So one is how big is that delta here that I observed? And then obviously how, how variable are my sample means if I were to repeatedly sample uh, those populations. So this is uh, where signal to noise ratios come in. So you can think of the delta as the difference between an arbitrary value and a mean that I observe. Um, that's my signal and that's my noise. And if my signal to noise ratio is larger, like I've drawn this here, so those sample means would be spread out more. And there could be re two reasons for this. Maybe my population is more variable or because my sample size is small, right? So if I have a small sample size, this will increase. And if my population is very variable to start with, that, that will also be larger. So if I have high signal to noise ratios, if my signal is bigger than the noise, I'm pretty sure that p-value here, uh, that percentile is pretty small. Uh, but with small signal and lots of noise, then my area under the curve here, so that p-value, that percentile, uh, that I could be wrong uh, about this one sample mean being truly uh, larger than 650, um, that probability increases. So then I get higher p-values. And the same would work for two sample t-tests, right? So my signal is simply the difference between the two means, and the noise is what I have uh, in sample one plus the noise that I have in sample two. So the same here. Uh, if I have the same signal, let's say variety B is 508 and variety A is 727.5, that's uh, what our data shows. So if, if the ratio of the signal over noise is high, then I can be sure of my results. Uh, so there's little overlap. And if the signal to noise ratio is low, in that case, I can't be sure. And this will be reflected in my p-value in the end, in my certainty at the end. So the interesting thing is that the t-test statistic is actually a signal-to-noise ratio. And I wonder if you remember how that was calculated. So pause this video for a moment and see if you can put that in here. Do you remember how we did the axis conversion from original values to down to t-values? Um, does that calculation make sense in the context of a signal-to-noise ratio? Does this reflect that right? See if you can put that in here. So what do we do to get from the original units here uh, down to t values? So we converted this value down to that t value axis, right? And um, if you recall, uh, what we did is we took the 650 and we subtracted the mean, and then we divided by the standard error. So that is exactly a signal to noise ratio, right? So the 650 minus the mean, that's my signal, and the uh, noise is the standard error. In this way, to calculate a test statistic, that is uh, also something that is universal for uh, any kind of statistical test. And so whatever you do, if you have a t-test or f-test, analysis of variance, or a z-test or chi-square test, that test statistic is always a signal versus noise metric. So it's not always a ratio. Most of the time it's a ratio, but it always is bigger if you have a bigger signal and smaller if you have more noise. So that's very handy. Often if you see your test statistic, like the t-value, you already know what the deal is, right? So if you have a test statistic of 5.6, uh, that means my signal is 5.6 times stronger uh, than the noise. So then your p-values will be very small, and so you can be sure of your statistical statements that you want to make. And if your signal-to-noise ratio approaches 1, uh, that normally means signal is the same as noise, uh, so I can't really be sure what's going on. And if it's less than 1, that means that the noise is actually larger than the signal. So then you're usually on the wrong track, you're making sort of an opposite claim. So that would apply if your statistical statement were to say that mean of variety A is actually smaller than 508. And, um, and the nice thing about the signal-to-noise ratios is that they are primarily up to you. You know, uh, you have control over those. Uh, if you remember, 
um, these are distributions of the means, right? These are not distributions of your actual data. So if you want a bigger signal to noise ratio, all you need to do is crank up your sample size, right? So put more work in and increase your sample size and you will eventually get a bigger signal to noise ratio. So if there's an important question that you really want the answer, these signal to noise ratios and these test statistics are under your control. So that signal to noise ratio, that's an important uh, concept to keep in mind. You know, the signal to noise ratio actually makes it sometimes into the news. <laughs> uh, it's the weirdest thing. Um, you know, a few years back when they uh, discovered the Higgs boson uh, at the Large Hadron Collider, right? That, that was not a discovery that was there all of a sudden. Um, so they, they fired up that Large Hadron Collider and had it run for months on end. And, uh, you know, sometimes the physicists, they, they were then, they were interviewed and uh, they said, oh yeah, we, we, we got a candidate, we got a signal there in our detectors. But then that, that sort of died down as the month went on. And then after a year or two of operation, uh, all of a sudden there was the news, oh, we have a two sigma signal. And then there were, there were rumors that, uh, you know, they discovered something big. And then after one more month, uh, they had a, a signal to noise ratio of three. So the headline was, or what the physicists thought was a good headline. They said, oh, we got a sigma. So sigma means standard deviations, right? So we have we have a sigma of three. Uh, so they, they were all excited. And eventually they had a sigma of five. Uh, so sigma of five qualifies for a major discovery. So, you know, you don't hand out Nobel Prizes based on a sigma of three. Uh, you want to be really sure that this is for real. Uh, so that's why they just kept collecting data and uh, reducing the noise, right? So by having ever more samples, uh, ever more collisions to evaluate. So this is inherently extremely noisy data. But regardless how wide this spread of noise is, if your sample size is large enough, you can bring that down to whatever you need. So eventually, once they exceeded five, they made the big announcement and that did get the Nobel Prize. So now you know exactly what the physicists talk about when they talk about sigma. They don't even bother with p-values because that's good enough information. So, two sample t-tests. How does it work now? So I will explain it to you. It's actually not all that simple, but I think uh, you might be able to figure something out. Uh, so think about it. What's the signal? What's the noise for two sample t-test? Uh, let's do this for the variety A and B. So here are the numbers. Uh, you can put that into R. You know how to calculate the means, the standard errors. Calculate a t-value for me. You know, how would you do that? Um, you can also try, give it a shot, and once you get the t-value, you can do a p-value. So I recommend you do it on a one-sided uh, basis, so just for simplicity, to, uh, to see if you can get this to work. Let's assume we want to make the statement variety A is better than variety B. And um, you want to calculate the probability that you're wrong about this, right? Or that you're right about that. The, uh, that would be 1 minus p. So you can check whatever you do against the t-test function, alternative uh, equals greater to make it one-sided, and uh, see if you get close to that p-value. So I don't think you can 100% figure out that p-value. So th there's a twist uh, to this that I will show you in the next video, but you can get close. So you should get an answer that's not too far off.